Welcome to Talking Art. We're at the Deerfield Arts Bank. I'm Jane Treger, and we're continuing our conversation with local artists. Uh, at this point, we have uh, a new exhibit at the uh, Deerfield Arts Bank. It's called Weaving Up and Down, 13 Tapestry Weavers. Look forward to seeing you. And in the meantime, we continue our conversation, and this time with Gary Smith. Welcome, Gary. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, then we'll decide that at the end. See how you feel about this whole interview business. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, Gary, um, you are, I think, the first one who, when I ask you where are you from, you're going to say? Northampton Mouse. Wow. So, a local boy. Yes, well, I am. I and, am. And now you're in? I'm just down the street in South Deerfield. Wonderful. And, um, <clears throat> and can you tell us about how you started your art? Did you go to art school? Did you draw since you were three? Well, um, I started when I was very young. Um, the influence of Batman from the late 60s and my brothers collected comic books. Um, my mom from an early age knew that I could draw, so she encouraged my drawing. And I knew from that early age I wanted to be a comic book illustrator. So I have here some comic books. Which one should I start with? These black and white ones? Um, start with the black and white ones. So we have, we have two. We have this one here. Um, this one is... Well, how do you say that? Donild. Donild. That's a play on um, a neighborhood um, individual. He used to pick on me a lot. His name was Donald. And the only way I could get back at him, because he was much bigger than me, was to make fun of him through my artwork. Fantastic. And Thank we you. should all learn from that. <laughs> and so you created a whole. This one says um, co-starring Jeline. Yes. Um, yeah, well, this is your first one here? Uh, that's issue three. This is the first one. And I always wanted to have my character Donald with a female character who is very strong. She's the one who does all the heavy lifting <laughs> because I think that's more intimidating for a bad guy to be beat up by a woman than it is the standard <laughs> man. Um, and they, it's... More or less, it's a cosmic soap opera, uh -huh. which allows me to draw aliens and do all sorts of stuff that we don't really have on this planet. Uh huh. <clears throat> well, that's what we do with our superheroes. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So, uh, and we call them in when we need them. Yes. Uh, Jolene, here we go. J uh, I like the Jolene character, and in a lot of ways, um, she's based on me. Um, because I can't pick people up over my head and throw them through the wall, but uh -huh. she sure can. Uh -huh. And the Donald, he's the classic grim type hero who, you know. So you wrote the text and did the drawings. And I did the lettering as well. And the lettering. It's extraordinary. And how many did you do like this? Um, I'm gonna. I'm on issue four right now. And. When I was working on those, I found that the characters were getting a little too dark and they weren't laughing as much, so I needed something a little bit lighter. So I came up with the Tales of Jolene, which is Jolene from the Donald book, but at a much younger age, where oh. she's happy, she's a teenager. Uh -huh. um, her dad sends her to this school, much like the other goddesses wear on the first day of school. She meets Pallas Athena, and Athena is always associated with an owl, so that is Uhu. Uh -huh. And the three of them go out through the galaxy, and they learn different ways mm -hmm. about life. And any of the old TV shows that I grew up on, like Johnny Quest or Space Ghost, you always had a little animal that would be the monkey wrench, and do, and you know, do cute things. So that's Uhu. That's Uhu. And Uhu is German for owl. Uhu. Uh-huh. And, um... An onomatopoeic word. Yes. And I just, um... I found myself enjoying this. The art style is a little bit different. 
um, but I can put down concepts in this book that will have ramifications in the Donald book when Jill is probably in her mid-twenties. Now at some point she turned into a color cartoon, a comic book. Um, I felt last year I needed something to motivate me so I went on my Facebook page and said I'm going to do my first color comic book. Now let's stop a minute. When did all of this artwork that we see here begin? I first began painting in 1999. Well, so this is a while ago. So m while you're doing these black and white comic books, you're doing these paintings. Yes. So let's, uh, because the art form that you're using in color in here is visible here, let's go back and we'll finish up with this afterwards. Okay. So tell us a little bit about, first of all, it's obvious from here and from most of the others we, that you've brought in that you like trees. Yes. Is that an overstatement? Um, no, it is not. Um, I grew up, I was fortunate enough to grow up in an area of East Hampton at the base of the mountain where I spent a lot of years in the woods just drawing trees. And when, and just as a kid you were drawing? Yes. When did you start this? technique? Um, in the mid 80s I was doing a lot of pen and ink very detailed trees. I did not do color until late 90s. Um, I didn't really think I had a sense of color but then I just... I, 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 it's hard for me to know what 80s means. Maybe you should tell me more your age and not your age now but so, for instance, you went to the Joe Kubert School for Cartoon and Graphic Art, and you told me you went there when you were about 23. I was 23 at that so, time. So, so these cartoons came after that. Yes, it was what I learned through the Kubert School, and then I did some professional work in Manhattan for a comic book company that really helped me to understand how to ink even better. Uh -huh. And then I, a lot of the mistakes I made back then inking or learning and growing after I did all that work in for Valiant Comics, I really had a firm grasp on inking. So the painting, yep. this came after that? Yes. Okay, so you come back to, uh, where was the school? The Joe Kubert School in Dover, New Jersey. Okay, so you came back from New Jersey and you started this. Um, so where did you, first of all, what gave you the courage to suddenly not only leave black and white but go into this brilliant style? Um, well, in Northampton uh, with a friend one time I was looking at particular pieces of art and I was criticizing it and I was informed, well, why don't you try to do it? That's when I started. Uh -huh. and With which medium? Oils. You went straight to oils? Yep. Um, did somebody show you how to use them, or did you just experiment? Well, what happened was one of my teachers at the Kubert School, he wrote a list of names of famous American artists, and I eventually took that list to the Forbes Library, and I learned a lot of the other artists, but when I came across Maxfield Parrish, who was extremely popular at the beginning of the last century, I had one of those aha moments where it was like, I, I want to paint like that. His, his pieces glow, unlike anybody else's. Uh -huh. And he was doing exactly what I wanted to do. Beautiful women in the woods, in diaphanous gowns, in trees. <laughs> And he was very detailed, and okay, and he made so me feel very small. Oh, but I learned his technique. Yeah, um, and I've incorporated that. So, how did you learn his technique? Uh, research. And, okay, and, and what is his technique? Um, his technique—it's nothing new to him or at the time. It's um, called glazing, and that. Usually what it means is he would start out with all blue and then he would paint his much like a blue dinner plate. Then he would let that dry. Then he'd apply a layer of varnish. 
and that would seal that layer. And then he would add his subsequent colors, whereas if he wants a purple. Well, let's look at, let's take a picture. Let's take, which one would you like to talk we'll about? We'll start in the middle, because that's some um, Okay, so, so this progress. very tall one with the green tree, yes. Um, I've started out with blue, um, and you can see those various areas. And then I just... You've varnished the blue. I've varnished it. And then I, where I want purple, I will add a rose matter. And I'll do all the rose you matter. Matter, M-A-D-D-E-R? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I let that dry and varnish it. And the purple that you get from that, I think, is much prettier than if you just used purple out of the tube. So every place we see purple here, yes. there's actually blue behind it. Yes. And you put down rose, not purple. Um, yes. Or this rose matter. Yes, yes. It's, it's, uh -huh. and I use these colors pure from the tube. So, so you, you just put them on in, in no particular shape, just sort of blotchy things. Just kind of blotchy. And then you went to which color after that? Um, and then you varnished it. Then I varnished it. Th then what then color? I uh, let's see, where there's the green, um, Naples yellow, or that brighter Indian yellow was used to come out with unusual shades of green. But you knew ahead of time that you were going to have these two trees here. I didn't really plan it out. I just... But as you're working. As I'm working, I just have that... I like... You have a sense that you're going to have some orange leaves up there. Y yes. I, I go with intuition a lot with painting. I wouldn't um, make less of that. That's quite amazing to me. Um, I prefer the improvisation because if I plan out a piece like that, unlike the comics. That's what I was thinking. Um, the comics have to be well planned really, out. Really, Because yes. of the anatomy and, and the storytelling. And you're, you're the camera. So you're the movie director. You're everything. But here... But these, these are more, I just let it happen. In some so of the, what was the last color layer here? Um... I think I probably stopped with those oranges. Well, when did the white go on? Uh, oh, the white, that's just the color of the canvas. Oh, wait a minute. I thought you said that you did the whole thing blue first. Um, no, no, no. Um, I Just the, um, the trees, the rocks, where the water would I be. I see, I see, I see. Um, so you do have a sense of where you're placing your colors as you're working. Yeah, I'm still winging it. But and is the white is the white isn't really canvas, is it? That's the canvas. Oh, how interesting! So, so it, it's the canvas, but with multiple layers of varnish. Yep, and the because you varnish the whole yep, surface. Yep, and the key is light will go through all those colors, hit that white surface, bounce back, and hit your eye, and the colors that you perceive. It's much like holding a Kodachrome up to the sun, and you see all those different kind of colors. And they glow. They really glow. Let's look at the other, the other two down here. <clears throat> well, well, when we, why don't we just, we'll come back to trees because you have lots of them. Why don't we go to this over here? This is one of your di diaphanous ladies in the woods. Uh, yeah, I like doing romantic paintings. So tell um, me what's going on here. Um, beautiful woman just selecting some roses or bizarre flowers that I just What's Creative. going on on the bottom left? I like that. That's um, very interesting to the me. The bottom left, that's somewhat inspired by Gustav Klimt and ah, some of yes. his shadings. And I'm also a junior geologist. And so I have quite a nice rock collection. And what I've done in certain areas with those shapes are there's a thing called, or a rock called mica. There's yes. Usually it's shiny. There's also smoked mica, which is a tannish color. And I bought a large piece. I used an X-Acto knife to cleave off some colors that were really light. And then I just used scissors, cut them into shape, and just pasted them down. So you have the stone right in there? Yep. And I thought, well, that's a, I've never heard of that before. Why not? Right. Um, same thing on her arm. And it's just a different element. On her arm, has that too? Um, yes. Um, her 
at her from her elbow to her wrist. Uh -huh. um, that's with the slate too. And, um, and what's on the top right? Uh, it's just an idol. Um, I like, I like archaeology too, so I kind of like ancient... Idol. I idol. I see. Mm -hmm. um, I like the Greeks, the uh -huh. Egyptians, uh, you know, I love all that. If I wasn't going to be an artist, I would have liked to have been an archaeologist. Because I could still do artwork and do that, but uh -huh. I don't like the heat that much. So, so this is with the same, uh, the same technique. This is your technique. Yep. So, so in here, in, the, in the, these two unbelievably gorgeous blue trees that have, I don't know, they, there's a reflection in them. It's sometimes I'm not sure if I'm looking at two trees or if I'm looking through a hole back into trees that are behind there. Um, oh, I'm also I'm fond of dropping and cast shadows from a tree that's outside of our picture frame. It's extraordinary. And it, when you use shadows, you can help define the surface and you, can, you give it more of a dimensional look. And it's just... Where are you showing this work? Um, well, these three, the two on the uh, left, they're not quite completed. Um, they still need some tweaking. Um, I've That's the one with the green tree and the orange one we haven't yes. looked at yet. Mm -hmm. And the one that you were just speaking of, I've been told that it's done. I think it's done. Um, and that's fine with me because I can move on to getting these done. So um, there's something extremely surrealistic about this blue one. And, and, and where do you get, I was asking where you show your work. Do you get to show it? Um, Right now, I have a piece in East Hampton at the Lucy Gallery, mm -hmm. which is on display. Um, this month, mid-month, I'm going to have two pieces up in display in uh, Turner's Falls for the art culture. I dropped those pieces off yesterday. At, at um, where? At the Turner's Falls Art Culture. Um, it's on First Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, there's a gallery there. I haven't seen the gallery. I just dropped off the paintings. but. And you're uh, going to be in a show here. Um, I'll Land be in escapes. a show here. Mm -hmm. um, in, I'm few, going, in a couple of months. I'm also going to have landscapes. Um, I do a yearly, I participate in a yearly show at Mystic, Connecticut, which is a huge event. And I have friends who live down there, one being a fellow graduate of the Kubert School. So we both do comic books and we both do paintings. And they live down there, so... I have so, a nice place to stay. That's good. <laughs> that's very important. Can you want to talk about this one here that's with the yellow and, hmm, let's see, a lot of yellow. I'm not... Um, I am just want to use different, at this point... I, Why is it not finished? Um, because I've been, I'm working on nine pieces all at the same time. So, what, I mean, what does this one need still? Um... Well, I know one of the trees isn't quite done. It needs more branches. And it just, when I feel it's done, or when somebody else tells me it's done, <laughs> um, that's when I stop. I have a problem with knowing when to stop with my paintings. I could keep going. What, um, it, what was the first color in this one? Um, I believe I probably started with India ink. Um, to, to draw out the and trees and the yeah, and the, it, it's a faster way for me to draw, which also ties in with my comic book work, because I ink with a brush. Yes. So my comic book training has taught me how to paint some really fine details with just the brush. Indeed. So this the green trees also has uh, brush uh, India ink brush. Work. Um. Nope. That's pure color. But this one does, and I can see that, that there's a sort of a silhouette-ish kind um, of... I just... But it, it, turns, it turns bluish. Um, that's because I put a blue on top of it. It's extraordinary. And, and we, ha we did have a teacher who would always recommend putting a few drops of cerulean blue in with our washes. Oh, I must um, have a very good eye here. And um, Yes, you do. <laughs> um, and it's just anything pretty much that the teachers would say to me at school, I wrote down. I didn't 
understand it totally at that age. But you, but you I knew took eventually it, it would click in my brain. Now this one behind us here looks like earlier work. Am I right? Um, yes, you are. This is um, my second piece that I painted, starting in '99. It took me a few years. The technique is much different. At that point, I was cutting out stencils um, of the trees because I didn't have my tone approach. I use large Chinese stipple brushes and I kind of will lay down the color and pounce it. So when I have a stencil, I'm creating a sharp edge here. Uh -huh. And then I just take the stencil and peel it away. Right. But nowadays, I don't even do that anymore. I right. just, I go cold. But it's still the same glazing. Yes. And these other two over here? Um, same thing. This was done at a time when I used to pencil out the trees. And then I found that, oh, just, just wing paint. it. Just, just paint it. I'd save a lot more time. So the background, though, doesn't look drawn. The background looks... No, it's just um, the pouncing and creating that tonal effect right. um, with the oil. It's and I'll start... It's very evocative. Very dark up at the top. And then with that stipple brush, I can create a gradation and bring it down. Uh -huh. And then in various areas with the clouds, after I've let that initial color dry... Yeah the varnish, yeah. and the next color, like the Naples yellow. Yeah. When that's still wet, I use Q-tips, and I'll pull away that Naples yellow to reveal the color underneath, oh. which is really handy for clouds and uh, shadows and unusual effects. Oh, I would love to watch you do this. And um, this piece over here is a classic example of me improvising when after I'd finished that green tone, I went to put down a different type of varnish. And I thought instead of using the spray, which I normally use, I would just be able to take a brush and just sweep it over. But the varnish um, acted as a super eraser oh. and erased the entire beautiful tonal area. And I freaked because I knew it was going to dry very quickly, given the magic stuff that I put in the right. oils to speed up the drying. So I just took Q-tips and I just started swirling into clouds. Oh. And I created um, my, my favorite part by accident. These are Q-tip clouds? Yeah. And that's when I started doing Q-tip clouds. Um, and... It, Are you using the Q-tips here, too? Uh, yeah, I go through an awful lot of Q-tips. <laughs> um, and uh, I do recommend the Q-tip brand over um, the cheaper No, 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 no we, we, don't, we don't endorse different companies okay. here. <laughs> wow, so, <clears throat> <laughs> so at what point did you decide, while you were doing all of this, that you were going to... This is not your usual comic book painting. This looks like the same style that I'm looking at here, but in a comic book. Well, um, that's pretty I, unusual. The, the company that I worked at, they used to hand color the comics. That was before everybody started using computer coloring. I don't like computer coloring, and I know how to paint. Uh. And it's far faster for me to just paint the stuff on those pages and it's part of me and if um, if I'm going to paint something I think my approach is much nicer and um, it's a lot more work uh, for the comic could, book Yes, but it's a labor of love and, and I like hand lettering we were taught we had a lettering class well, the hand lettering would have been anyway, right? Um, no? They have programs where people don't even have to letter anymore. They just type in their dialogue. Oh, and, and I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it, 
it always looks like handwriting to me. Well, that's um, that's that's what, what they did. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, and I just, I will work out the pages in full color. Then I kind of know what my characters are going to say, and then I letter all that on a separate piece of paper, and then I just cut them out and paste them down the way they used to. And that's one of the upcoming pages. You've never seen a comic book like this. Thank you. Um, I I put a lot of emotion into it, and I'm quite proud of it. Where do you sell this? I mean, uh, we, we, we carry it here, but where else do you sell it? Uh, those are available at Modern Myths in Northampton. Mm -hmm. And I have all the books, and this, actually this book um, is part one, and what I'm working on right now is completing that book, so that the full book will be on sale in May, but I would like to get it done in April. And Comic books do not do this with one space. Um, not no. not most. No. Um, and that's I just took the brush and I just winged it. So every one of these is a separate picture, or do you do the whole page as uh, a picture? It's the whole page, and um, and then you you draw it out and then you paint it in. I draw it out with the same technique, the same varnish. Yep. Oh, so um, are with this these? is on paper. I use watercolor paper, I'll pencil everything out, ink it, then I will use some watercolor or gouache and colored pencils, then I will spray it, then I will go we'll spray in, it with varnish. We'll spray it with varnish, and then go in with the oil glazes on top because if I put the oil right on the watercolor paper, yeah, it just, it, just, it right. soaks it up. Right. And, 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 um, wow, you've learned, you've desi designed, you've devised a m lot of different interesting techniques here. Well, I felt it's my book. I can do whatever I want. Absolutely. And I'm just going to get better at it. Mandrake I, Studios is you? Yes, Mandrake Studios. This is 2011. Well, this um, is extraordinary. Um, I'm, I've, I think that, I think we have a gift here in South Deerfield. Gary Smith, you are a, 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 a gift, a gift to the community, to the art community. You are an, am an amazing person. And uh, I'm thrilled that you came here to let me ask you these questions. And, um, I, you, you satisfied my curiosity about a lot of things, and I look forward to seeing many more things, and including your pieces in my Land Escapes exhibit later uh, on. You're going to enjoy seeing some that you haven't even seen yet oh, that are I the will. same size as the 20 by 40. Okay. I, I love them all. Thank you very much, Gary Smith. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you also for watching. This is Talking Art. I'm Jane Treger. We were talking with Gary Smith today. We are seated in the Deerfield Arts Bank, and we'll see you next week. If you have something you want to say, like a suggestion of someone you'd like me to interview, or something I should be asking, please address the email below, which I believe is talkingart at fcat.tv. Thank you.